Joshua chapter 24. I don't know how much we'd be in this book here this week, but the Lord has kept me here. So here we go. Joshua chapter 24. We're in chapter 8 last night, talking about having some victory um, in, in your life. And that is an important thing. I want to thank you for uh, everything that you've done for us, accommodations to stay in, the, the meals, and just being taken care of. That's always a wonderful blessing. Whether we're family or not, that's still a blessing um, either way. So Joshua chapter 24, and obviously this chapter is, is, the, is the end of the book, and it is the final address uh, of Joshua, and it is his final plea uh, to, this, uh, to this group of people that he has been a major part of their life since he was a young man under the, under the, the supervision of Moses, and God has used him um, in their lives to bring them to the place where they have the possession of the land, uh, that God had promised to them. And he brings them to a, to a place in this chapter, and it is a place of choosing. Let's go ahead and read a couple verses, and then we'll, we'll uh, jump up to the top and then come back down through uh, this chapter. But Joshua chapter 24 and verse 14 says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served uh, on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose ye this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I'd like to preach you tonight as we as we close out this this camp meeting on choosing your own way. You've you've heard a lot of preaching and you and you've taken in a lot of content. And with that should be a draw to make a choice. Yeah. Uh, preaching shouldn't just be another thing that we consume. Right. Because if we're not careful, preaching can please our flesh more than it helps our spirit. Yeah. And that's how we get favorite preachers because they say nice things or they just preach flowery things or, or they just, you know, they're, they're very upbeat in their personality. Yeah, but what are you hearing and how is God speaking to you and what choices are you brought to make? To, to be making in your life so that you can change and be more like Jesus Christ. Right. That is the point of preaching. Right. The point of preaching isn't because I couldn't do anything else for a living and I need people to give me money. Right. That's not the point. The point is to come to a place of decision and choosing either you choose God's way or you choose your way. And as we all know, God will let you make that choice. He'll let you make that choice at any age. I've seen a lot of people make bad choices when they were young, but then I've seen a bunch of people up earlier in age when things aren't going as they thought as the kids were leaving the house, and then mom and dad split, and it all becomes a big mess, and all the good choices they made down here are wonderful, but what about now? So choosing your own way, we do it each and every day. When we get up in the morning, we make choices, of how we're going to serve God and what we're going to do with the day that God has given to us. It's His time. It's His energy. We're breathing His air. Right. Come on. So what choices are we making? Joshua brings them to the place. They have everything that God had promised to give them. And God is wonderful. He gives us many blessings. But what do we do with them? They had the land. Great. Now, what are you going to do with it? Yeah. What choice are you going to make? How, how terrible it is to have the blessing of God all the way through your life and then turn your back on it. Because your way at that point seems better. Let's go back up to verse number one and let's notice, first off, the recited history. It is always good to remember where you came from because then it's a reminder of what God has done for you to bring you to today. Well, the word he mentioned in his life, 1975, where God brought him from there. Those are good things to remember. Some of you, he, he literally found you in a miry pit. Some of us, we made different decisions, and God drug us out of a pit in our mid-20s or our mid-30s or however it was. But there should be a place where you can go back and remember where God found you and where you really gave your life to Him and His way of thinking and what the Bible says. Okay, from that day to now, 
it's good to go back and look at all of those things. Right. And that's what Joshua does with them. Joshua gathered all the people, verse 1, all the, all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers and they presented themselves before God. Keep that in mind. Anytime you come to church, yeah, you're hearing a preacher, but you're placing yourself before God. You're in the place where God wants you to be. So, yeah, there's a man speaking, but you ought to be hearing from God. And if you're not hearing from God, you may need to make some different choices in your life. I, I believe you're still hearing from God here. I think I can say that pretty confidently. I hope so. Verse 2, And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood and led him throughout all the land of Canaan and multiplied his seed and gave him Isaac. And I gave unto Isaac Jacob and Esau, and I gave unto Esau Mount Seir to possess it. But Jacob and his children went down into Egypt. I sent Moses also and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt according to that which I did among them. And afterward I brought you out, and I brought your fathers out of Egypt. And ye came unto the sea, and the Egyptians pursued after your fathers with chariots and horsemen unto the Red Sea. And when they cried unto the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians, and brought the sea upon them and covered them. And your eyes have seen what I have done in Egypt. And you dwelt in the wilderness a long season. And I brought you into the land of the Amorites, which dwell on the other side of Jordan. And they fought with you, and I gave them into your hand, that ye might possess their land. And I destroyed them from before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and warred against Israel, and sent and called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not hearken unto Balaam. Therefore he blessed you still. So I delivered you out of his hand. And you went over Jordan and came unto Jericho. And the men of Jericho fought against you and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. And I delivered them into your hand. And I sent the hornet before you, which drave them out from before you, even the two kings of the Amorites. But not with thy sword, nor with thy bow. And I have given you a land for which you did not labor. In cities which you built not, and you dwell in them. And of the vineyards and olive yards which you planted, not do you eat. In this recited history, notice number 1, verse 2. Uh, you can find that in Genesis chapter 11, uh, verse 26. It's good to remember where it is that you came from and why you are standing in the place that you're standing today. Yeah, yeah, amen. There was other men in my life, in uh, my dad and his dad, that made choices that bring me to where I am today. And that is a great weight and a great burden and a great responsibility that I feel that I must do something with. Otherwise, then why were these good choices made back here? We're not in this life to just live our life of what we want. What does God want us, want us to do? Verse number 3 is in Genesis chapter 12 through chapter 24. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Esau and how God moved in their life and how God directed them and, and how God did uh, certain things in their life and how God had everything planned out. Nothing was a mistake. And Joshua was going back and saying all these small details that, you know, it's just part of the history. Here we are, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but through in all those years, God was stepping in and, and, and God does stuff that we don't even acknowledge each and every day. And he's bringing them through this history. In verse number four is Genesis chapter 25 through the rest of the book of Genesis into chapter 50. Je uh, verses five through seven, we have Exodus chapter one through Exodus chapter 12. And verses 8 through 12 is Numbers and Deuteronomy. It's good to go back and see, hey, what did God do for me? Where did I almost mess up? Where did I mess up that God covered it up? Where did I mess up that God blessed it anyway? Those are all good things to go back and remember. Why? Because each of those was a choice. And what choices were made before you that brought you to today? And I believe we hold in our hands, when we stand before God someday, we're going to stand before Him for choices that we've made that we think are frivolous and not a big deal. Yes, sir. But to God, they're a big deal. And Joshua says, hey, you guys need to choose you this day whom you will serve. Notice, introduction as well, not only the recited history, but the reminder of His goodness in verse 13. I hold in my hands, King James Bible. 
I believe it. It is absolute, the inspired, perfect, infallible Word of God. I don't need to bring the Greek or the Hebrew to it. It is God's words as He wanted me to have them. And I've done nothing to do that. But there were some people that did. There were men that gave their lives up. There were men that watched their families murdered and butchered and raped in front of them. Amen. To keep those words where they are. Amen. Well, I just like this other rendering better. Really? What was done for that Bible? Let me tell you. There's people making money off that. That's Bible. right. That's right. You got a copyright on it. Why? So they can make their money. The blessing of God, the reminder of His goodness is, is a wonderful thing. And listen, we live in a land that most of us didn't labor to have what we have. It's just the blessing of being here. If you drive a car, you're a rich person in the scope of the world. Yeah. And sometimes we get down and out and molly grubbing about where we're at, what we have or don't have, and we've still got life good. That's right. Amen. Not many of us are missing a meal. <laughs> and we're adding some in there every once in a while. Amen. If it sounds good, we generally eat it. Yeah. Why? Because he's good. Amen. We're eating of vineyards and olive yards that we didn't plant. That's it. Yeah. So what are we doing with that? It's God's blessing and it's God's goodness. Watchman Nee said this, The believer at minimum can declare by his will that he wants the truth, that he wants to know and obey the truth. By prayer and by choice of will he ought to resist Every satanic lie, whatever form it may take, whether a thought, an imagination, or an argument. And all of those things help you make a choice one way or another. And what we intake affects our choices. I always say this, you better be careful when you're just on the internet, listening to this guy preach and that guy preach and reading this and reading that. You don't know the background of them. And before you know it, you could be down a really deep rabbit hole of some conspiracy theory with some whack job that lives in his mom's basement. <laughs> and then you come to church and argue with your pastor because he doesn't believe some guy that you don't even know. You know nothing about him. And we take that idiot's word more than the man of God that's put in front of us. Happens all the time. Yeah. I have friends all the time when people leave their churches. Why? Because it's some moron on the internet whom they've never met. Thoughts, imaginations, and arguments, what are they from? They're from Satan. Satan wants to distract you. If you're young in here today, he wants to distract you. So that your life means nothing. If he can take your life as a Christian young person and convince you that you need to live for you, and that doesn't mean drinking and partying, that just means living for the American lifestyle. If he can convince you that that's how you need to live, he wins. Because your life ought to be his. And that's not saying you can't work a full-time job. You should. If a man doesn't work, you shouldn't eat. You ought to work a full-time job. But what local church are you in? And what things are you doing for God in that church? And, and how are you supporting it? And what is your witness like? Because he'll tell you none of those things matter. And just because you're old doesn't mean you're done. You say, what's old? I'll let you decide that. Yeah. Just, just whatever you think. I got a guy in our church, Jim Bradley. Jim is 74. Oh, that's old. He's 74. Still driving a truck. And he said to me the other day, he said, Preacher, can't wait till we get a building so we can start doing something because I ain't done yet. That's a blessing. Amen. Amen. And the Satan will come into your life and convince you where you're at, your age, whatever, that you can't do anything for God and you'll start making selfish choices to put you on a different path than the path that you've been on. And he wins. Yes, he wins. Amen. You're not out living a, a nasty lifestyle. You're not even a, a real bad example of what a Christian should be, but you're not a good one. Yeah. Church becomes just a whenever. Yeah. Yeah. Your Bible just sits there. Yeah. You don't talk about God at work. Ooh. Why? Just little, little, little choices of things that you never thought you'd, you'd make those choices or back off of stuff. But if we're not careful, we do. So we've come through a week of preaching. What has the week of preaching helped you make choices in your life with? Do you even remember everything you heard? 
That's why it's good to go back on YouTube and listen to them again. Let, let God speak to you again. Listen, you'll hear different stuff second time around. Uh, Marissa showed me, my, she's been showing me notes. I went through Joshua earlier this year in, in, on Sunday mornings and she's showing me notes and I'm preaching different. I preach for a friend of mine who's got a, during COVID he had to switch his services because he's got a big crowd of older people. So they wanted to be masked and separated. So he did a 9.30 and a, or he did a 9 o'clock and a, and, a, and, a, and a 10.30 service. Well, COVID left. Both services grew. And he can't go back to one Sunday morning service anymore. He don't have the space for him. So what does he do? He keeps on preaching the same message. So he asked me to come down a few months ago. It was uh, July of last year I went down and preached for him. And I told him, I had never done this before. And he said, you'll be all right. I preached that thing totally different an hour and a half from each other. Go back and listen again to what God said to you. You'll hear something different. That's right. Amen. And maybe he'll just reinforce the choice you need to make. Oswald Chambers says, the majority of us do not enthrone God, we enthrone common sense. We make our decisions and then ask the real God to bless our God's decision. That hurts. Sometimes I read those things and I'm like, oh, so true. It's so true. We let our spiritual common sense rise to the top. And that's where we make our choices. And then after we've got ourselves in a bind, we say, uh, Lord, are you good with this? Just give me a thumb up emoji. Yeah. We'll be good to go. So when I'm going to make a choice, let's, let's look at this tonight. I tell you I'll be quick, but I don't like to lie. Let's look at verse 14. If I'm going to make this choice, in choosing my own way, what do I need? Number one, in the first part of verse 14, I need sincere service. He said, now therefore fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in truth. If you want to play a game, play a game with a human. Don't play a game with God who knows everything about you. You can fool me into thinking that, that you actually come to church here all the time. I don't know. Dad doesn't tell me that kind of stuff. I don't know if you're here or not, but you can fool me. I'm just here for the week. But God knows. And He knows the service that you are doing. Are you doing it just to please the pastor? Or are you being sincere in the service that you're doing? He says, serve Him in sincerity and in truth. I need sincere service. Service is an attitude, number one, of conscience. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12 says, For our rejoicing is this, that the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we've had our conversation in the world, and more abundantly to you were. Listen, your conversation is the way you live your life. And people that are serving Jesus Christ should have a good attitude when they're doing it. And Paul said, we have lived and served in front of you in godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom. He said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.3, I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with a pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Our service ought to be sincere and that should come with an, uh, an attitude of the conscience that controls everything in that area. When I'm not serving God right, that ought to bother my conscience. When I'm serving God with the wrong motive, that ought to bother my conscience. Somebody asked me uh, not too long ago, so you're a pastor now, so how many people are you looking for? I said, I didn't know I was in a numbers game. I didn't go to that college, so I didn't, I didn't take, that, take that down. I said, I'm looking for whoever God brings. And whoever brings, that's who we'll work with. And that's it. Well, you're not going to go head hunting for what? I just, I just told the church a couple weeks ago. I said, I'm not looking to be an evangelist and to be out all the time. God didn't call me to do that. Amen. I told him, I said, I didn't ask anybody to come up here. It was my dad that called, and I don't have much more time, I don't think, and so we're coming. Amen. That's just honesty. He's not getting any younger. Right. Our service shouldn't be so that other people see what we're doing. Amen. Right. How's your attitude in your, in your service? He said, serve him, but serve him in sincerity and in truth. 
What will help with that? Philippians 1.10. That you may approve things that are excellent. That you may be as sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Not only an attitude of conscience, but the acknowledgement of error. When I'm wrong, I can say I'm wrong. Amen. When I've messed it up, I can say I've messed it up. Don't let pride come side by side in your service for the Lord. That doesn't even seem like it fits together, but it does. Amen. Because there's too many of us that can't say that we've done it wrong. Yep. Or what I said, I didn't say it appropriately. Or in the right manner, or in the right fashion. Amen. And in that sincere service should be this. 1 Peter chapter 2, 2, a verse, you know, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby, there should be that acceptance of truth. Amen. If I'm going to serve him with sincerity, truth has to be right there with it. Amen. Truth is the guidepost for the sincerity in my life, and you're holding the truth. Amen. That's right. So it means that book is your guidepost. Amen. Right. I don't need somebody's um, book, what's that called? Commentary, thank you, John. I don't need somebody. I have them. But I don't look at them much. Amen. I just try to take my time and spend it with God in this Amen. book. And I believe he's got what he wants me to have. Amen. But if I'm all the time looking at somebody else, I'm going to get stuck at looking at somebody else and relying on somebody else. Yep. And my relationship with God won't grow. That's not very sincere, is it? Amen. That's pretty fake. I thought about having my wife do it, but I don't think people could handle it. The truth she dispenses is much stiffer than mine. Amen. Charles Finney said, A state of mind that sees God in everything is evidence of growth and grace and a thankful heart. Where, where do you see God in your life? If you're not bumping into him all the time, you need to start inserting him everywhere. I hope you never have to remind yourself that you're saved. A.W. Tozer said, The stiff and wooden quality about our religious lives is a result of our lack of holy desire. Complacency is a deadly foe of all spiritual growth. Acute desire must be present, or there will be no manifestation of Christ to his people. How accepting are you of the truth of the word of God? You know where it will show? In your sincere service. And you will grow. If you water the garden, the vegetables will grow. Right. If you get into that book, you'll grow. That's right. And you'll understand it more. Amen. Preaching will become more alive to you. And if you're in that book more and you come to hear preaching, you know what God will do? He'll start connecting dots for you. That's right. Aaron and I were talking last night, and he said God connected a dot for him. He had working on a message, and he had this thought and this thought, and he's like, I don't know, and then all of a sudden, boom, God put it together. You know what that is? That's just spending time with God and letting God put that stuff together. I've had God do that in the pulpit. Yes, where I'm just preaching along, and all of a sudden I'm preaching something, I'm like, Lord, I, never, I, I didn't even see that. I didn't even see that until this very moment. And that's a wonderful blessing. Yeah. If I'm in my choice making, listen, I need to have sincere service. That, that, that sincerity comes from the truth that I put into the inside. And so the tell on that is, if this is all about me and what people say about me, it means that I'm just being religious and I'm not taking the truth and putting it on the inside because when I do that, it comes out. You want your marriage to be better? Get in that book. You want to be a better parent? Get in that book. Listen, Dad, God will correct you when you need to be corrected. Amen. You want to be a better church member? You better get in that book. Amen. Number two, in the second part of verse 14, not only sincere service, but here's one that we don't even feel like we need to do. He says, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. How about sincere setting aside of idolatry? You would probably say, well, I don't have any statues in my house. And I would say to you, nay, nay. <laughs> I bet you do. I work for a builder, and his wife's a Buddhist, and she's got a whole Buddha room upstairs in their house. Freaky. Freaky. 
with him going there. Walk right up by. Get me in there with that stuff. A.W. Tozer said, The essence of idolatry is the entertainment of thoughts about God that are unworthy of him. Wow. We've taken idolatry and we've put it down to a statue or a carving or a piece of wood. And in our culture, in America, that's not idolatry. Do you know who the biggest idol is? It's me. When I'm, when I'm not serving God, do you know what the reason is? Me. When I've got a bad attitude, you know, you know, you know who I'm serving? Me. Yeah. So, so then you would say, well, then what is idolatry? I'm glad you asked. Amen. Thank you for asking that, because that makes this easier. First Samuel chapter 15, verse 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. And here's why Samuel said that to Saul. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. How, how many times have you heard preaching from this book? And it was to you. It was God's mail to you. And inside... As a two-year-old or a three-year-old does, they're not going to do it. You know what that is? That's idolatry. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm not bowing down to nothing, preacher. Yeah, you are. You're just bowing down where, you, where no one else can see it. But inside your head, you ain't doing it. You can't make me do that. That's idolatry. I don't like that. I don't find that fun and enjoyable. I don't like those truths because those truths sting. It would be easier if we had an idol sitting in our house. That would be easier to get rid of. If there was a physical wooden statue that we could bring, Friday night is burn your idol night at the altar. Piece of cake, right? We used to burn the records, right? And the tapes. Now kids today, if they're in the wrong kind of music, you're burning like 400 bucks a pop. Throwing in a whole electronic device in there. It would be way easier if I were to say, tonight we're going to burn our idols and everybody just brought them down. But if, you all, if we were all to do that tonight, it would have to be me and you standing in the fire. Yeah. Because my stubbornness keeps me from serving God the way that I should. Yeah. And it keeps me from making the choices and changing things within me that God says change that. Yeah change that attitude. I don't like that vice in you, and you need to get rid of that, and <clears throat> Amen. ain't doing it. Amen. Amen. And if God works with you like he does me, you know what God does? Okay. And he backs off and leaves me all alone. And then I do that for a couple days, and then I'm going, Lord, where are you at? And he says, well, you remember that? That's got to go. Are you going to serve that, or are you going to serve me? But it's not just stubbornness. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. I went to a friend's house last weekend, weekend before. Down in Finley, it's about 45 minutes south. And he just bought him a, it's a Yamaha 600 quad runner. And I hadn't been on one of those in a few years. It's five speed. He's got 12 acres with a lane that runs down all, that, all, all, all 12 acres. I don't know how fast I was going, but those tires were looking for grip every time I made a shift. And that wind was against my face. And I got to be honest, I was a little tough. It's just dumb things like that that keep us off the path that God wants us to be on. I don't need. He just and then he just texts me this week with a picture of a motorcycle and says, "Tell me I don't need this." And I told him, "You don't need that." I said, "You should have done that with the photo, but you didn't." I don't need that. 
but my flesh thinks it does. Yeah. I'd like a snowmobile. But Casey, when am I going to ride that? <laughs> Winter time. But how am I going to do that? There's, just, there's, there's no time for that. But my flesh still looks at them. So I, I still want one. Covetousness is idolatry. So what do you covet? I probably didn't name yours. But you got something. Yeah. And the time that we sit just scrolling through those things we looked up on Facebook Marketplace. It's idolatry. I don't like that. Go to Exodus chapter 32 and look at verse 1. Exodus 32, it's stubbornness is idolatry and covetousness is idolatry. If I'm going to make a choice for God, I'm going to have to be able to set those things aside. I have to put them away. Exodus chapter 32, verse 1, When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves unto Aaron and said, Up, oh, make us gods which shall go up before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what is become of him. Aren't we fickle? And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives and of your sons and of your daughters, and bring them unto me and the people. And break off the golden earrings which are in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool. And after he had made it a molten calf, and they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. You know what else is idolatry? Replacement. What in your life and in my life replaces God? Let me ask you this. What replaces God's time? God should get time every day. He should get time on Sunday. And listen, I'll say this. I know this. The people that I'm going to pastor in the world that I'm going to pastor in is not the same one my dad did. For me to stand up and say, if your job makes you work on Sunday, you need to quit your job and find another one, I find that a bit foolish in the economy and the world we're living in today. I think you need to do your best to not do that. But that's not an every case thing. I think if you go out of way to try to, to remedy it, to fix it, I think God will bless it. But God should still get his time. What are you replacing in your life that God should have? Uh, D.L. Moody said, you don't have to go to heathen lands today to find false gods. America is full of them. Whatever you love more than God is your idol. Yeah. What do you love more than God? Well, you know the answer to that because you know what takes that time, what takes that energy, what takes that money. You're telling yourself and you're telling God what you love more than you don't need me to go through a list. And that's what we like as Baptists. We like the list. Preacher, give me a list. That way I've got it all. That way I know what things are not on there and those things are okay. No, no list for me. I'm not giving you a list. Amen. You know in your life. Yes, sir. You're thinking about it right now. Mm -hmm. You know if you're stubborn. You know if you're covetous. You know if that's a problem for you. Mm -hmm. I don't need to come sit in your home. I don't want to come sit in your home. If you're going to feed me a steak, maybe. <laughs> But I'm not going to go spying. Listen, you know. You've walked with God long enough. You know. In my making of choices, there needs to be sincere service. There needs to be that sincere setting aside of idolatry. Me saying to God, God, these things are in the way. Uh, these things are a hindrance to me serving you. This attitude is wrong and it needs to go. I'm sorry that you were wronged 20 years ago. But holding on to that and keeping that attitude is keeping you from serving God. And yes, they were wrong for what they said. But let me ask you this. In those 20 years, have they cared one time? Let me answer that for you. No. And so you've got to be big enough to set that aside and just serve God in spite of all that junk. What's in the way of you making a choice? Sincere setting aside of idolatry. Then verse 15. He says, and this is a strange phrase. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord. 
Well, why would it ever seem evil to serve the Lord? Uh, here's why. Number three, sincerely just doing what you've always done. Because maybe what we've always done isn't right. Maybe what we've always done isn't what is pleasing to God. It's just what we've always done. It doesn't make it right. He says, and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, then choose you this day whom you will serve. Just because you've always done something doesn't mean that's what you need to continue to do. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 6, God comes to Abram and says, Hey, you need to leave your father and your mother and your house, and you need to go over here. Well, where's that? I'll tell you when you get there. Okay, and away he goes. Abraham had to leave everything that he had always done. The people that he had always been around. The way of life that he had always had. And Abram walked away from it because God said, I need you to go there. When's the last time you gave God that much liberty and latitude in your life? It hinders the choices we make. If God doesn't have the freedom to come into your life and shift things around as He wants, you're not going to make wise choices. Right. Because the stubbornness and the covetousness are the things that are controlling what you're hearing that God wants you to do. And when you hear what God wants you to do, you're fighting against what you think it will do to you and how it will have ill effects in your life. Yeah. Once again, I don't like that. Genesis chapter 48, verse 28. Jacob makes a choice. He said, it is enough, Joseph, my son is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. Abraham makes a choice, and then Jacob makes a choice to take his family to Egypt, where Joseph is. Changed his life forever. Yeah. But he left everything behind. He went to a place he didn't know. He went to a place where he and his occupation were hated. Yeah. He was spit upon for what he did. And yet he was willing to go because that's where God told him to go. Exodus chapter 3. Moses is confronted by God at the burning bush. And he said, hey, I want you to go back to Egypt. And I want you to bring my children out. And we all know how that went. He had 3,000 excuses of why he couldn't go do what God told him to do. And yet he went. And he faced the people that he didn't want to face. And he had the conversations he didn't want to have. Why? Because he gave God the latitude to point out things. And they made the right choice. What choice were you supposed to make this week that you haven't made yet? You holding back on anything? Has God come into your life and landed in a certain spot? And it seems that every message is just pointing at that and pointing at that and pointing at that. And your stubbornness is just kicking it out. You don't know, Abram, what your choice will do for other people. Jacob didn't know what his choice would do for other people. Had, had no idea. Right. Moses really didn't know what effect he was going to have on those people's lives. And yet they all still made the choice. Henry Ford is credited with saying this, and sometimes, you know, the internet is not always truthful. <laughs> but I think he said this, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. Yeah. And if you give God no room to make any changes... And maybe to put you into the uncomfortable. And maybe to put you in a place that you didn't ask to be. In a position you didn't ask to be in. God's not going to have room to work. And the choices that you'll make will be extremely limited. So Joshua stands up before them. He, God has given them all this land. And he's, he's given them everything that he said. And he's cleared it all out for them. And he says, hey, you guys need to choose you this day. Verse 15, whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. There needs to be, number four, a sincere separation. He said you have to make a choice. Yeah, I know that this is what you used to do, and, and this is what you used to be known for, and, and this is maybe something that your parents did, but today you need to make a choice whether you're going to serve God or whether you're just going to continue to do what you've always done. And there has to be a dividing line. You can't have both. Right. Amen. You cannot serve God and mammon. can't be done. 
It's been tried a million times, and every time that it's tried, it's a fail. Can't be done. You must make a selection. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 26, the Lord said to Israel, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing and a curse. Something good and something bad. The issue with not being in Old Testament times and living in the age of grace, sometimes the bad takes a couple years to catch up. Because God will just let you run and do your thing, and He'll just let you run and do your thing. And I don't even think sometimes it's God that's just raining down fire like on Sodom and Gomorrah. But sometimes it's just dumb choice after dumb choice and selfish choice after selfish choice that we just start to reap that stuff. And God's totally taking his hands off and he's, we're just driving the car. <laughs> we don't know where we're going or what we're doing, but we're going. It's just me. Yeah, it's covetousness. It's stubbornness. That's driving the car down the road that God didn't put us on. Amen. Say, well, it's not that big of a choice. Do you, do you really know that? Well, nobody's going to get hurt. Well, maybe it won't hurt you, but will it hurt your kids? Will it hurt your grandkids? Then that's a pretty big choice. It's not always easy just to stay faithful. When you're being drugged through it, when everything you've known and everything you've been around has been totally lost, you staying faithful to God is the hardest thing to do. But if you don't do it, what effects will that have? If you don't stand on it, what effect is that going to have down the road? Oh, you may be fine. But what are the kids going to say? What are the grandkids going to say? It matters. It matters. He said, hey, you must make a separation between what maybe was and what maybe was accepted back here and what God's expectation is today. God gave him a fresh start, a new beginning. And so the question is, what are they going to do with it? Here you are at the end of camp meeting. Lots of preaching. Choices made. But have you made all of them? Or are you holding back on something? Notice in verse 23... How do I do this? Like, how do I, how, how do I go ahead and make this choice? Verse 23, he said, Now therefore put away, said he, the strange gods which are among you, and incline your heart unto the Lord God of Israel. Number one, put away what's in the way. Make the choice. Well, it's hard. Yeah, I know. Because none of us like change, whether we want to admit it or not. We get up in the morning and we do what we do. We go through our day. We get home. We do that too. And I don't like change. I, I don't like things to be out of order. Everything has its place. But it may be that you need to put away what's in the way. And that may be an attitude. That may be the way that you approach your life. Maybe you've taken over the reins. And God would just like <laughs> to get a word in. <laughs> if I could just make a suggestion about the road we're going down. This one ends in a cliff. If we could just take this exit right here, it would be better. End of the verse, he says, incline your heart. Hey, listen, put away what's in the way and then incline your heart. You want to make a choice? Get in with God. Find out what does God say? What direction does he want me to, where, where does he want me to go? What does he want me to do? He said, incline your heart unto the Lord God of Israel. Let God know that you are interested in what he wants for you. God has a plan for you specifically. No matter where you're at in your life, no matter what stage you're in, God has something for you to do. 2 Kings chapter 8, verses 57 through 58 says, The Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. Let him not leave us nor forsake us. This is Solomon speaking. That he, that he may incline our hearts unto him to walk in all of his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments which he commanded our fathers. What if it's not just you inclining your heart, what if you gave God the freedom to come into your life and lean you towards him? That's control. That's giving God a whole lot of room to move. Right. Solomon said, Lord, you come in and you incline us to you. Yeah. When was the last time that's happened? I said it the other night. When was the last time you personally 
saw God move personally. It wasn't just an extra emotional thing, but no, God came into your life and God spoke to you and God moved you. <coughs> Better have a bookmark on that. And if you don't, I, I would ask why. <laughs> Could be stubbornness. Could be covetousness. And listen, maybe the covetousness isn't a quad runner. Maybe you just covet your time. And God's not getting his. Notice in verse 31, not only put away what's in the way, incline your heart. But verse 31 says, And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua, and which had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. How about this? Lastly, faithfully continue forward. Just faithfully keep doing what God said to do. Well, you sure God didn't change his mind? Let me check. No, he didn't. He didn't. I've never came into my Bible one time where God, God made an adjustment of what he said. No, he said it yesterday. He said it 100 years ago. He said it 200 years ago. And if you're talking in the world's philosophy, he said it 32 billion years ago. Yeah. <laughs> And he hasn't changed his mind. Right. Paul said to the young man Timothy, when I called to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Maybe here's what you and God need to talk about tonight. God, just help me faithfully follow you so that those that are coming behind me have someone else to follow. Listen, we don't know who's following. We don't know who's watching. We really don't ever stop to consider the choices we're making and the ramifications of which they have. Say, well, nobody knows me. You sure? You sure? We really don't ever really know who exactly is watching. But I know this, we're all making choices. What choices is God leaning on you to make? What choices has God pointed out for you this week? What adjustments in your life has God said, hey, you, we need to work on this, and we need to change this? That's the point of a meeting like this. Right. It's the oversaturation of the scripture and the, and the hearing from the voice of God so that God has the liberty to get through the stubbornness and the covetousness and to say, hey, we need to adjust this and we need to change this. Here's the question tonight. What choices do you need to make? What things in your life do you need to adjust?